everyone. Uh, my name is Mrs. Zombie and I teach fifth grade at Shenandoah Elementary. I have really missed my students and I've really missed teaching reading. Even though I've had a, an opportunity over the last couple of weeks to read for fun, I've missed the chance to read closely. So today we're going to read a text closely to be able to answer questions from the text and make inferences using the text. This is the third video in the KCS at Home series. So hopefully you were able to join Ms. McElDoon the last couple of weeks as she led you through the text of Green Island and the activities that went along with that. However, if this is the first time that you've been able to do a video, it's perfectly fine. We're reading a new text today. It'll be easy for you to jump right in. The text that we're reading comes from the Sleuth magazine that you have in your classroom. You may have read some of the stories in here. You may have even read the story that we're gonna read today. If you have, it's fine. Good readers reread quality text to increase fluency and comprehension. So if you've already read this text, you'll just be doing that. Let's get started. Before we begin our lesson today, I want to go over a few tools for success that will help you to really get the most out of this video and to understand the text. The first thing you're going to need is a copy of the text. So hopefully you've been able to get a packet from one of the school um, sites or you've been able to download it on your computer and print off these pages. In addition to the text, you will need some writing tools. So a pen, a pencil, a highlighter, a marker, a crayon, anything will do, but we are gonna mark up the text a little bit as we read. If you don't have a copy of the text, it's fine. I'm gonna be marking up the text on the screen so you can follow along with me there. Um, these other tips are really gonna help you get the most out of the video. So first of all, you could pause the video right now and read the text first. That would help you to get an idea of the main idea of this story. It would also help you to see if there's any vocabulary in there that you need to look at a little bit more closely before we get going. If you're having any trouble hearing me, then you could use this button at the bottom of your screen if you're watching through YouTube or through the KCS website. This will allow the words that I'm saying to appear at the bottom of the screen. If you're having trouble understanding me or if I'm talking too fast, you can click this button and change the playback speed in your settings. If at any point in the video you need to pause so that you can take a little bit more time to read or to think or to find evidence, then you can hit this button and pause for a second and then jump right in. Also, you could watch this video with someone in your home. Oftentimes at school, we interact a lot with partners to talk about our reading and talk about our thinking. So if you have somebody at home that could watch this video with you, you could interact with them. Finally, you could summarize the information in the video. Um, after we've watched the video, you could write a sentence or you could draw a picture that represents the information that was in the video. Then you could have the person that watched the video with you to look at it and see if they agree with it. Then you'll be really ready to start the act other activities that follow up. As I mentioned, the text that we're reading comes from the magazine called Sleuth. Another word for sleuth is a detective. When we read, we act like detectives. Not detectives that are solving a crime, but we do want to read the text closely to get the most out of the text. So follow along with me, either on the screen or in your packet, as I read the introduction to our sleuth magazine. From the Super Sleuths. Subject, mysteries. Dear Junior Sleuth Hound, mysteries are all around. There could be a mystery on your playground. There could be a mystery in a faraway land. There could be mysteries between the pages of this book. So what do you do to solve a mystery? Become a sleuth hound. Look for clues. Ask interesting questions. Then put all the pieces together and prove your answers. This book gives you a chance to practice skills that sleuths use. As you read this book, use the super sleuth steps to find answers to some really big questions. Good luck. I want to pay attention to that very last sentence. Use the super sleuth steps to find answers. We need to be familiar with these super sleuth steps. So let's look at those. The first super sleuth step is to look for clues. Clues can be anywhere in the text. They can be in the words or they can be in the pictures. 
sometimes these clues will have the exact answer we're looking for, and sometimes they give us hints to help us find the answer. We're going to be doing both of those today. Sometimes we need to ask questions. Maybe we come to something that we don't understand or we are interested and we have more questions about it. You could think these questions. You could write these questions down. You could ask these questions if there's someone watching the video with you. The make your case and the prove it steps go together. Just like when we're writing an opinion piece at school, we have to state our opinion, then we have to back it up with evidence. So the make your case section is where you're deciding your opinion, and then the prove it is when you actually use the text evidence to back it up. Even if you have not read the text that we're going to be reading today, you probably have read some texts that were related. Because in Unit 4, the text that we read at School from Reading Street all had to do with adapting. Do you remember what adapting means? Adapting means changing. And we read two texts that had to do with adapting. We read Westlandia, and in Westlandia, Wesley had to adapt to a difficult situation. He was being bullied and school was getting out and he had all this time off in the summer. He had to fill that with some, in some way. So he adapted by creating these inventions to kind of help him protect himself from the bullies. But he also created his own civilization with several inventions within there um, to pass his summer. We also read the text Exploding Ants. And in Exploding Ants, we looked to see how animals adapt to survive. In that text, we read about some animals that did some really disgusting things to find food or find shelter or to protect themselves. The text that we're gonna to read today in just a few minutes is related to both of these. There is gonna be people that adapt to difficult situations. There's also gonna be an animal that has to adapt. But the animal in this text doesn't adapt to survive. We're going to have to read that text to figure out more about the animal adaptations. As we read, we're going to be looking and using at these um, sleuth tips. One of our very first sleuth tips is to look for clues. And whenever I'm looking for a clue, I like to start with a title because the title gives us a really good clue for what the text is going to be about. So read this title with me, Helping Hands. When I read that title, it makes me think that this text is going to involve hands that help. Do you agree? Let's look for some more clues. Look at the pictures. What do you see in the pictures? And how might those pictures be related to helping hands? First of all, I see a picture of a monkey. In the text, this monkey is called a capuchin monkey. The author has actually thought that we might not be able to, uh, to pronounce the name of this monkey, so they've given us a pronunciation guide in here. You're welcome to use that as often as you need to so that you can pronounce that correctly. I also see a picture of a man in a wheelchair. It makes me think that this man in the wheelchair might could use some help. Do you think the monkey might be helping him? We'll read to find out. We're going to actually start looking at our text right now, but as we look at it, I'm going to be asking you to read paragraphs and the marks and things in your text. So the first thing I want us to do, there's actually two paragraphs in this section. This is the first paragraph and this is the second one. So we're going to go ahead and label those. We're real clear on what we're reading. This first paragraph starts with a sentence, life is filled with unexpected events and challenges. Automatically, that makes me think of our question about how do people adapt to difficult situations. A challenge would be a difficult situation. So let's read this paragraph together to find out what those difficult situations or challenges might be. Let's look at this sentence. Some of these seem like impossible obstacles, especially those that impair mental or physical abilities. Do you see a challenge right there? Sure, they use the word obstacles, and obstacles is another word for challenges. And in fact, they describe them as impossible obstacles. So if it's an obstacle that's impossible, it would be a very difficult challenge. What is the example of the obstacle that they mention right here? 
Yes, they mention things that would impair mental or physical activities. Impair means to weaken or to damage. So if our mental, our ability to think, were weakened or damaged, or if our physical abilities, our ability to move, like to write or to run, if that were weakened or damaged, would that be a challenge? Absolutely. So impaired mental or physical abilities would be a challenge. Let's keep reading. Serious illnesses and spinal cord injuries that cause paralysis can change people's lives overnight. What challenges do you see right there? A serious illness would be a challenge. An injury would be a challenge. This specifies an injury to our spinal cord. That is the bones that go along the middle of your back. The spinal cord injuries lead to another problem. The text says that it can cause paralysis. The word paralysis means a part of your body can't move or doesn't work. So if a person had paralysis or a spinal cord injury or a serious illness or impaired mental or physical abilities, all of those would be challenges. How do you think a person might adapt to any of those kinds of challenges? In this next paragraph, it actually talks about one way they adapt is to use a service animal to help them. So I'm gonna have you read paragraph two on your own, and I want you to be looking for two things. First of all, I want you to look for what kind of animals they're using as service animals, and how do those animals assist or help the people? What animals are they talking about right here? Primarily, they're talking about service dogs. And how do these service dogs help these people with their challenges? The text says that they provide companionship. It says that they help people see and walk. It says that they warn people if a seizure is coming. A seizure is a type of a serious illness. They come on real suddenly and they usually affect your brain. So if a dog were able to warn someone that a seizure was going to happen to one of these people, they could get help and hopefully the severity would be limited. At this point in the paragraph, it kind of switches to the other animal, the animal from our picture, the capuchin monkey. In between here, it shows a big difference between the service dogs and the capuchin monkeys. What's the difference between them? Absolutely, it says right here that dogs don't have hands, capuchin monkeys have hands. Keep that in mind, it might be important later. Let's look now at our next section. This section only has one paragraph, but I do want us to go ahead and number it. This would be the third paragraph in the entire text. We're going to label that paragraph three. As we read paragraph three, I'm going to have you looking for the goal or the purpose of the organization called Helping Hands, Monkey Helpers for the Disabled. Before I have you read that, there is a word in here that might be a bit of a challenge. That word is quadriplegic. The word quadriplegic has a root in it, quad, and quad means four. Someone that is quadriplegic has paralysis. Remember, that means a part of their body doesn't move or work, but they have paralysis in four parts of their body. That's where the quad comes in. So a quadriplegic means that their arms don't move and their legs don't move. That makes them a quadriplegic. Say that word with me quadriplegic. When we look at this man in the wheelchair, do you think he might be a quadriplegic? As you're reading this paragraph three, remember I want you to look for the goal or the purpose of this Helping Hands organization. Go ahead and read paragraph three.
right in that paragraph, I see the word goal. It says the goal was, if I keep reading that sentence, I'm probably going to find the goal. So let's read it. The goal was to help people who were severely physically challenged, often quadriplegic. So the whole purpose of this organization was to help these people who had paralysis in four parts of their body. Why do you think they chose monkeys to help them in this organization? What do we know about a monkey that would be helpful to a quadriplegic? That's right. Remember when we read in the previous section, it talked about monkeys having hands. Well, the quadriplegics, they have hands, but they don't work. So these monkeys could be very helpful in assisting these quadriplegic when doing things with their hands. In fact, it looks in the picture right here that the monkey might be helping to make sure his foot is in the wheelchair correctly and, then, and kind of taking care of his shoes. Let's go ahead and read our next section now. We are going to number these paragraphs as well. There's two paragraphs here, so this is going to be paragraph four, and this is going to be paragraph five. Paragraph four actually starts off with a stated main idea. Right there in that very first sentence, the author tells us what that whole paragraph is going to be about. So let's read that sentence together. Capuchin monkeys make fantastic helpers. I want you to read paragraph four, and I want you to find the evidence or the details that support Capuchin monkeys make fantastic helpers. The text says that they're intelligent, they're friendly, they're curious. That could make them helpful. It also says they have strong hands. We've already talked about that. It says they have flexible grips. That can help them to pick up items. It can help them operate simple devices. That means that these monkeys can be helpful um, if a quadriplegic has dropped their sock. Then a monkey could pick up the sock for them or get their shoes for them. Um, it could also help them to operate simple devices like pushing buttons on the microwave or controlling the remote control. The text also says that these monkeys are small and that they live long lives. That could make them very helpful too. So far, we've read a lot about how people are adapting to this difficult situation of an illness or paralysis. And one of the ways they adapt is using service animals, particularly monkeys in this case. We haven't talked much about how the animal adapts though. So paragraph five is gonna describe how the animal, the monkey, has to adapt to this situation. Read paragraph five to figure out how monkeys have to adapt. As I mentioned earlier, in this story, the monkeys are not having to adapt to survive. Instead, they're actually adapting to a new situation, living with humans. So they have to adapt by learning to wear diapers, take baths, and live in a human environment. That's not something that they would do in their natural habitat. It also says that they go to school they go to school because they have to learn to be a good helper. Again, that doesn't happen naturally for a monkey. Um, when they're learning these things, they have to learn to fetch, to go get things for people. Um, they also have to learn to turn on lights or open bottles. Those are not things that they would typically do in their natural habitat. So all of their adaptations are not for them to survive, but to help the humans out in the human environment. Let's go ahead now and look at our next section. Our next section, we're going to label those paragraphs as well. We've got paragraph six right here, and we've got paragraph seven right here. 
paragraph six kind of continues talking about the monkeys adapting to a human environment, but they're particularly talking here about the process of matching up a monkey to the human. And they describe this process as stringent. The word stringent means strict or precise or intense. I want you to read paragraph six. And based on what we read there, I want you to think about why the process of matching a monkey to a human would need to be stringent. Read paragraph six. The sentence right after the word stringent says staff members carefully interview potential recipients to ensure good matches. They have to work stringently or carefully because it's very important that they match up the monkey to the human so they can build that good relationship. If that, the match doesn't work, then the monkey isn't going to be a good helper for that human. Um, finally, we're going to look at paragraph seven. Paragraph seven doesn't exactly have a stated main idea, but it does kind of hint at what this paragraph is going to be about toward the end of that first sentence. It says, the wait is well worth it. Those words make me think that these people that are waiting on a monkey, they think that it's worth it to wait. So by the time they get their monkey, they're pleased with their monkey helper. So I want you to read paragraph seven and I want you to find evidence that shows that the wait is well worth it for these people. The wait is well worth it because the animals are helpful. They can help them prepare food, they can retrieve objects, they can scratch their itches. They're also well worth it because if that match is just right, then they get companionship, they get loyalty, and they get love from their monkey. Now we have finished reading this text, the Helping Hands text. We've had an opportunity to answer questions using evidence directly in the text, and we've also made some inferences using what was in the text. We've also been able to look at some vocabulary. We have looked at how people have adapted in a situation, and we've looked at how animals have adapted. We've been able to read the text. We've talked about the text. We've marked on our text. Now we're going to have an opportunity to do a little bit more follow-up activities that involve maybe a little bit more writing or a little bit more talking. We have a couple of options here that you could do after the video is over. One of them is to ask questions. Suppose you have the opportunity to interview someone who has a monkey helper. List three questions that you would ask the person about his or her experience. That means if you were to know someone who used one of these monkey helpers to adapt, what would be some questions about the relationship or about their job or about their helpfulness that you would want to ask? He goes on to say, make sure your questions cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. That means if you ask, do you like your monkey helper? Well, the person that you ask that question to would probably just say yes. Maybe they would say no, but probably they're going to say yes. You wouldn't get much information from that question. A better question would be, what do you like most about your monkey helper? then they would have to explain their answer a little bit more. So try to think of questions that wouldn't just be answered with a yes or a no. Um, another opportunity could have to do with gathering evidence, where you would list at least four text details that explain why monkey helpers are so good at their jobs. We have read several paragraphs that talked about how monkeys can be very helpful to these people that are facing challenges. So look for four things, four details that these monkeys do that make them really good at their jobs. And finally, there's the make your case option. That's the opinion part. Do you think capuchin monkeys make better service animals than dogs? 
that's the opinion, then you're going to tell why or why not by citing three reasons to support your argument. In all of these, you can write them down. You can talk about them with someone that watched the video with you. You can even think about them on your own. I have a few additional activities that you could do even besides those three. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, you could do a little research. If you have enjoyed reading this text about these service animals, you could go on your computer or your phone or your tablet and you could find out more information about capuchin monkeys and how they are useful service animals. You could also look up service dogs. This text didn't even talk a whole lot about service dogs. So you could find a lot more information about how dogs are used to help people. You might even want to look to see if there's any kind of other animal besides monkeys and dogs that are used to help people. You might be surprised at the animals you find out. Once you have done your research, you could do a presentation for your family. Um, you can do Google Slides and present all of your information to your family. You could take your information and write it as a bulleted list. You can make it into a paragraph. Or you could even write a whole essay, multi-paragraph essay, especially if you've researched several different kinds of animals. If you really want to be a little bit more artistic, you could create a poster. You could draw the animals that you researched and then illustrate how they help people. Um, another option for um, an extended activity could be to do a little morphology work. We looked a lot at the word quadriplegic that has the root quad that means four. You could see if you could think of additional words that contain that root. You could even ask adults in your house if they could think of any words that had the root quad. There again, you could even use your computer or your phone or your tablet to see if you could look up words that have the word quad. Once you have this list, then I want you to look at the meanings of these words or look them up if you need to. And how are those meanings related to four? Finally, you could do a little experiment. In this text, the fact that monkeys had hands were very important. And one of the biggest benefits to monkeys' hands and to our hands is that we have a thumb. So for this experiment, you could tape your thumb or not use your thumb and try to do some simple activities like zipping your jacket or buttoning your shirt or opening a package. And then have a discussion with somebody about your results or draw your, uh, the results of your experiment to think about how important that thumb might be. Um, now that we have finished our text um, and we have read it and we've talked about some different activities, um, I just want to thank you for joining me today. Thank you for participating in this lesson. Uh, I appreciate how we've been able to read the text, to be able to answer questions in the text and to make some inferences. We've also looked at um, the adaptations of the person and of the animal. Um, I really enjoyed you being with me today. Um, I hope to see you soon. In the meantime, take care. Bye-bye.